Welcome to Cardiovascular Physiology Concepts and a mini lecture on cardiac membrane potentials. Let us begin with a resting, non-pacemaker cardiac cell. If you were to measure the electrical potential across the cell membrane, you would find that the membrane potential would be about minus 90 millivolts relative to the outside of the cell. By definition, we assume that the outside of the cell is zero millivolts. The question we want to ask is this. What causes a cell to have a voltage that is negative on the inside relative to the outside? In cardiac cells, there are three ions that have a dominant influence on the membrane potential. They are potassium, sodium, and calcium ions. Chloride ions also play a role but they play a relatively minor role. So for the sake of this lecture, we will ignore the contribution of chloride. Let's now see how potassium, sodium, and calcium contribute to the membrane potential. Let us once again look at a resting non-pacemaker cardiac cell. Of the three major ions, potassium has the highest intracellular concentration. It's about 150 millimolar. When we measure the potassium concentration on the outside, we find that it is about 4 millimolar. Therefore, the concentration of potassium inside the cell is much greater than the concentration outside the cell. We term this difference a concentration gradient or a chemical gradient because the cell membrane is permeable to potassium. Potassium ions want to diffuse out of the cell down the concentration gradient. The potassium that is diffusing out of the cell moves through specific potassium channels. These are protein structures associated with the membrane that regulate the permeability of the membrane to potassium and thereby permit potassium to diffuse across the membrane. Because potassium has a single positive charge, a positive charge leaves the cell, thereby leaving behind excess negative charges because there are negatively charged ions and molecules, for example proteins, present within the cell. As the potassium leaves the cell, the cell becomes more negative on the inside relative to the outside. Remember, we assume that the outside is zero when referencing the membrane potential. A point will be reached when the negative charge inside the cell is sufficient to counterbalance the outward diffusion of the positive charges. When this occurs, the chemical gradient is in equilibrium with the electrical gradient. We term this the, the equilibrium potential for potassium. We can calculate this equilibrium potential using what is called the Nernst equation. This equation says that the equilibrium potential, or the EK, is equal to minus 61 divided by Z, which is the number of charges on the ion, times the log of the internal potassium concentration divided by the external concentration of potassium. Because potassium has a single charge, Z is 1, so we can just ignore Z. When we do this calculation now for the concentrations of potassium specified in this example, we find that the equilibrium potential for potassium is minus 96 millivolts. If potassium were the only ion that moves across the membrane, then the EM, or membrane potential, would be minus 96 millivolts. Another way of looking at this is that the equilibrium potential is the potential that is required to prevent a net outward diffusion of potassium from the inside to the outside of the cell. Now let's look at sodium. This ion has an intracellular concentration of about 20 millimolar. On the other hand, the sodium concentration outside the cell is about 145 millimolar. Therefore, the chemical gradient for sodium is reversed compared to potassium. Sodium wants to diffuse into the cell down its concentration gradient. Like potassium, sodium diffuses across the membrane through specific sodium channels that regulate the permeability of the membrane to sodium. Since sodium moves into the cell, 
This increases the number of positive charges inside the cell, thereby causing the membrane potential to become more positive. Because sodium has a positive charge, if we were to make the inside of the cell more positive, which can be done experimentally by voltage clamp techniques, we can reach a potential that would repel the positively charged sodium as it enters the cell. As done for potassium, we can use the Nernst equation to calculate what positive membrane potential would be required to counterbalance the movement of positively charged sodium into the cell. In the case of sodium, at the concentrations shown in this example, this equilibrium potential would be plus 52 millivolts. In other words, when the inside of the cell is plus 52 millivolts, there will be no net diffusion of sodium into the cell because its chemical gradient will be exactly counterbalanced by the electrical gradient. Finally, we will look at calcium. Its intracellular concentration is very low. It's about 10 to the minus 7 molar or 0.1 micromolar when the cell is at rest. The extracellular calcium concentration, however, is about 2.5 millimolar. Therefore, there is an exceptionally large chemical gradient trying to drive calcium into the cell. This calcium enters the cell through specific calcium channels. We can calculate the equilibrium potential for calcium using the Nernst equation. When we do this using the concentration shown, the equilibrium potential for calcium is plus 134 millivolts. Please note that when you do this calculation that Z in this case is 2 because calcium has two charges that are positive. Calculation of the calcium equilibrium potential tells us that when the membrane potential is plus 134 millivolts, there will be no net diffusion of calcium across the membrane. Now that we have seen how the diffusion of potassium, sodium, and calcium can lead to an electrical potential, and the relationship between that electrical potential and the chemical gradients for these ions, let's take this one step further to see how these three ions together determine the membrane potential. So what determines the membrane potential? First, the membrane potential is determined by the concentration gradients for potassium, sodium, and calcium. And second, the membrane potential is determined by the relative permeability of the membrane to each of these ions. This permeability of the membrane to ions is determined by ion channels. While permeability describes the ease by which a molecule can diffuse across the membrane, Another term is used to describe, in electrical uh, terms, the movement of charged species across the membrane. And that term is electrical conductance. When membrane permeability to an ion increases, so does its electrical conductance. To determine the membrane potential, the individual ion equilibrium potentials are multiplied by their relative membrane conductances and summed, as shown in the next slide. This equation is showing that the membrane potential, at least the top equation, is equal to the conductance of potassium times the equilibrium potential for potassium plus the conductance of sodium times its equilibrium potential, and then the same for calcium and any other ions. And this is all divided by the total membrane conductance for all of the species. Now we can, we can change this conductance to a relative kind of conductance by expressing the conductance as a conductance for a given ion relative to the, to the sum conductances for all of the ions. We call this G prime K. So in the second equation, we see that the membrane potential, or EM, is equal to G prime K times the equilibrium potential for potassium, plus G prime NA times its equilibrium potential, plus G prime CA times its equilibrium potential. If we substitute in the equilibrium potentials that we calculated in the previous slide from the Nernst equations, 
then we have that the EM is equal to the relative conductance potassium times minus 96 millivolts plus the relative conductance of sodium times its equilibrium potential of 52 millivolts plus the relative conductance of calcium times 134 millivolts, its equilibrium potential. Now what this equation tells you is that with these given equilibrium potentials, so assuming that these are the concentrations of the ions that we are working with, then the membrane potential will change as the relative conductance for an ion changes, or multiple ions change. For example, if G prime K were 1 and the other conductances were 0, then the membrane potential would equal minus 96 millivolts because the others would no longer, the other ions would no longer contribute to the membrane potential. If we had a situation where G prime K was equal to 0.5 and G prime NA was equal to 0.5 and G prime CA was equal to 0, then the membrane potential would be halfway between the equilibrium potential for potassium, minus 96, and the equilibrium potential for sodium, which is plus 52. So halfway between would be the membrane potential if the conductance for sodium was the same as the conductance for potassium. In this example, let's increase external potassium now from 4 to 20 millimolar and ask ourselves the question, what's going to happen now to the membrane potential when we do this? We are assuming that G prime K is high while G prime Na and G prime Ca, calcium, are low. If we calculate the equilibrium potential or from the Nernst equation with the elevated external potassium, we see that the new equilibrium potential is minus 53 millivolts instead of the minus 96 millivolts that we calculated when the external potassium was 4 millimolar. If the resting membrane potential is minus 90 millivolts and there is no change in ion conductances or other ion concentrations, then the new membrane potential would be approximately minus 50 millivolts. It will differ slightly from the new equilibrium potential that we just calculated because there is some finite conductance to sodium and to calcium that tends to make the membrane potential more positive than what is predicted solely by the equilibrium potential for potassium. Therefore, increasing potassium depolarizes the cell. That is, the membrane potential becomes less negative or more positive. We have seen that the chemical gradients for potassium, sodium, and calcium influence the membrane potential. Therefore, the presence of these gradients is really very important. So what maintains these ion gradients? This is important because a mechanism must exist to maintain these gradients because the cell is constantly having sodium diffuse into it as well as calcium. And on the other hand, we see that potassium is leaking out or diffusing out of the cell. And so if we had no mechanism to maintain these gradients over a period of time, these ion concentrations or gradients would be lost. So what maintains these gradients? Well, it turns out ion pumps maintain these ion gradients. Now this slide again shows the direction of the three principal ions as they diffuse in or out of the cell down their chemical gradients. Now let's look at the pumps that are involved in maintaining these gradients. The first pump that we want to look at is what we call the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. This active transport system requires ATP to supply energy. This pump transfers potassium back into the cell and sodium out of the cell. Without this pump, the cell would lose its potassium and sodium gradients and depolarize. 
Digoxin, which is a drug used in the treatment of heart failure, is a drug that inhibits this pump and reduces the chemical gradients for potassium and sodium, thereby causing depolarization. A second pump is the calcium ATPase pump, and it is responsible for transporting calcium out of the cell so that the intracellular concentration can remain low. This is very important because elevated intracellular calcium causes electrical and mechanical disturbances in cardiac cells. The third transport system is the sodium calcium exchanger. Although this exchanger can operate in both directions, generally it removes calcium from the cell in exchange for sodium. This exchanger is very important in the heart because when intracellular sodium increases due to, for example, decreased sodium potassium ATPase activity, less sodium moves from outside to inside the cell via this exchanger. And this reduces calcium extrusion from the cell. When this occurs, intracellular calcium concentrations increase. The three transport systems described in the previous slide are capable of contributing to the membrane potential because they do not exchange or move equal numbers of positive and negative charges and therefore generate a net current, either outward or inward. For this reason, these transport systems are said to be electrogenic. The sodium-potassium ATPase pump moves three sodium for every two potassium. Therefore, more positive charges leave the cell than enter the cell. This makes the membrane potential more negative. The calcium ATPase pump removes doubly charged calcium ions from the cell and therefore creates a negative potential inside the cell. Finally, the sodium calcium exchanger moves three sodium for every one calcium. So although calcium has two positive charges, the three sodium ions that are transported inside the cell produce a net excess of positive charges inside the cell. Combined, these electrogenic pumps contribute several negative millivolts to the membrane potential. In summary, the membrane potential is therefore determined by concentration gradients for potassium, sodium, and calcium across the membrane, the relative permeability or electrical conductance of the membrane to each of these ions, and this is regulated by ion channels, and third, the membrane potential is determined by electrogenic ion pumps. For more information on this topic, please see the relevant material published in www.cbphysiology.com or in my textbook, Cardiovascular Physiology Concepts.